How are the Pelicans going to rebound without an established center on the roster? What's the exact fit with Brandon Ingram? And who starts and who comes off the bench? I'll tell you why these are the biggest unknowns for the Pelicans and how it's going to impact their season. It's a Monday episode of Locked On Pelicans. Let's go. You are Locked On Pelicans, your daily New Orleans Pelicans podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to another edition of Locked On Pelicans, the daily podcast covering your favorite team, the New Orleans Pelicans and NBA. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Available wherever you get your podcasts and available on YouTube. I'm your host, Pelicans Insider, credential member of the media, Jake Madison, at Nola Jake on Twitter. Here with y'all on this Monday, we are back to five days a week here on Locked On Pelicans. Yes, Monday through Friday. So for you everydayers, it's five days a week. If you're not an everydayer, become an everydayer. That means you listen Monday through Friday to Locked On Pelicans as we gear up for media day, training camp, preseason, start of the regular season. It's going to be here before you know it. We're going to cover everything you want to know right here on the Locked On Pelicans podcast. I'm super excited for the year. There's a lot of things we know about this team. The defense is going to be good, right? Zion is still going to be dominant, but there's some unknowns too. And I want to look at three of them. Rebounding. What's the Pelicans plan? How could they be effective in that area? What's the fit with Brandon Ingram, the role that he is going to play? It evolved over last season. What's the plan going into this year? And then Somewhat of a who starts, who comes off the bench discussion really centered around CJ McCollum and Trey Murphy. Today's episode of Locked On Pelicans brought to you by FanDuel. Now through September 22nd, it's running out of time here. All FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. So let's get started with the rebounding here. And that is one of the biggest questions going into this season. So a couple of things with this. They were a good defensive rebounding team last year. They were six best per basketball dash reference, one of the sites that I use for all of this. Now, a big part of that was Jonas Valanciunas. Let's be real here. While he's not a good defender or a rim protector, defensive rebounding is defense. David Griffin called him a possession terminator. Thank you for that, Tyler. But given that JV played under 24 minutes per game, that sixth best ranking wasn't just all on him. The Pels, as the season went on, did an overall good job of team rebounding, and that's likely what they're going to need to do. Now, worth noting here that when you take JV out of any lineups and you can look at the defensive rebounding stats. They basically drop from sixth to 20th. Although there's some noise in those numbers too. Another thing to note that when they were closing games without Jonas Valanciunas, so clutch situation. So close game five, five plus or minus five points, five minutes or less. They were 20th too. more on that in a moment here. So, Not having him on the court hurts them, but they did find a way to get it done. They're going to need to do this again. They're going to need to team rebound. There's a knock-on effect of this because there's a balance. This is something that I've been talking about for like two years here now on Locked on Pelicans, how your offense and your defense are connected. I think it's closer to soccer, right? And, you know, where where guys kind of have to play both ways. And if, you know, you have a bad turnover on on the attacking end, all of a sudden a team can get you in transition on a break, something like that. There's the flip side of that here, right? So you need to balance rebounding. And then the flip side of that defensive rebounding is transition offense. There's a little bit of a misconception around the Pelicans that, you know, they're a transition team. They want to get out and run. They want to do all that versus just kind of being a little bit slower in the half court. And that's not really true. When you look at raw points scored in transition, the team was 24th in the league this year. They were not, you know, bottom five, essentially, when it comes to transition points scored. Their pace this year was 17th out of 30. They weren't a fast team running in transition or doing all that. Their offense was coming in the half court for the most part. It wasn't always pretty, but they did finish with the 11th best offense, nearly in the top 10. I know last season feels like a disaster and it was a disappointment, but there was a lot of good things that they can build on. You know, they weren't running a ton after opponents misses where you can secure the defensive board and then you just book it in transition. They were throwing 
guys at the ball to just try and secure the rebound to end it. You know, when it comes to the frequency of running off of a live rebound, the Pelicans were 22nd. So bottom 10 in the league when it came to that. They were 21st when it came to off of steals too. We'll look at the defense and the transition and how they can kind of run off steals with the addition of DeJounte Murray. That's going to be later in the week. But they weren't a running team and leaking out and just trying to get those those offensive transition opportunities and then giving up an offensive rebound to the opponent. They were crashing the glass trying to secure that board. There were maybe a couple of glaring times when you saw it and you go, like, this team's terrible at rebounding. Clutch situations tend to stand out with that. But overall, they did a good job of that. Is that truly who they want to be? If you're Willie Green, if you're David Griffin, no, they probably want to be a team that runs in transition as much as possible. Everybody does because your points per play, points per possession in transition are significantly elevated compared to what it is in the half court. And that's worth keeping in mind that when you have just easier opportunities to score, you're going to do better. But overall, the Pelicans didn't run a ton. You know, they had games where they did, where they forced those turnovers, and that's how they're going to do it. They're going to run off of turnovers, off of steals, not off of defensive rebounds. So I would expect them, because the center position is uncertain. Are they starting Daniel Tice? Are they starting, you know, uh, Carlo Makovic is going to be somebody else here. Trey Jemison is a name that I've said a lot before. You know, I think that's not going to mean you run as much. That can be okay. But if you also are running Zion at the five and going with a small ball lineup, and maybe that's what you should do, you're going to need to gang rebound, team rebound like that. But we don't know what the plan is just yet. How do you balance those two things? They do want to score more in transition. They'd like to be a top five offense. They should be a top five offense next year. You're going to need to score more in transition to do that. You can't be 24th and finish with a top five offense most likely. So how do you balance those sorts of things? That's going to be on Willie Green. That's going to be on, you know, the rotation and what the game plan is going in. And right now it's a big unknown, but it's going to impact both their offense and their defense this year. And that's why I have it as one of the kind of biggest unknowns and most important unknowns for this team. Let me know what you think. What should be the plan? Should they just try and run? Should they, you know, go with more of a traditional center in there just to help with the rebound uh, let me know what you think in the comments down below on YouTube. The thing we also don't know. Look, we know Brian Ingram is going to be starting and have a big role for this team. But what exactly is the role going to be? It's a big unknown right now. Let's discuss it coming up here next in today's episode of Locked on Pelicans. Today's episode of Locked on Pelicans is brought to you by FanDuel, America's number one sports book. We've talked a lot about FanDuel, but today we've got something a little bit different for you. Because now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Then with a YouTube TV base plane, you'll be able to watch every regular season Sunday afternoon out-of-market game. And all you need is a Google account and a current form of payment, and you can cancel at any time. Just visit FanDuel.com to download the America's number one sports book. Look, you, if you need a bet for your $5, you got the Pelicans minus five. That Chicago team is not going to be good. The Pelicans tend to do well in their home openers. That sounds like a good bet in my opinion. That's what I'm going to be taking. And you get NFL Sunday ticket on a three-week free trial. So go to FanDuel.com right now to download America's number one sports book. And thank you for making Locked On Pelicans your first listen today and every day. We're here Monday through Friday, the number one Pelicans podcast, covering everything you want to know about this Pelicans team. So please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Join over 10,000 Pelicans fans on YouTube as well. We are part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Become an everydayer. That means you listen Monday through Friday. And we're back to being Monday through Friday. And for your second listen, Locked On Saints. Did you see that game against the Cowboys? Because I am freaking excited. I know Ross Jackson is excited. I saw him this weekend too. He was there. He's going to break down exactly how the uh, the Saints offense exploded for those points. Go make Locked On Saints your second listen today. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So today on Locked On Pelicans here, we are talking about kind of the big unknowns. 
there, uh, there are things we know, right? This team is going to be good defensively. I'm very convinced of that. DeJounte Murray is going to be a good addition to this team. You know, they're, they're going to be competitive in the West. I feel confident in saying that where they finish. I'm not exactly certain, but there's some things we don't know. And I don't want to talk about the brain eating room trade stuff. I think we're all a little bit tired of that, even though we're still going to be talking about it because it's a thing, but right now it doesn't look like a trades immediate. So let's say he's on the team to start the year. Look, it's a certainty they're going to start him, but how do you use him? What's, what's the fit? What's, what's the plan? You know, I want to look at what a, a Warriors like death lineup for the Pelicans would look like later in the week. We're going to talk about that because there's, there's ways to make a lineup like that work. And we'll even hint at it in the next segment too. You know, and Ingram in theory is a part of that, but you need to find the right kind of role for him because that takes like a very specific skill set of players. And Ingram in theory could fit into that in theory, but doesn't necessarily. So how do you find that kind of balance to make it work? And I think that's kind of the big question. And his fit is going to be around that, right? You know, last year, when I spoke to Brandon Ingram at Media Day, you know, I asked him if he had talked to James Borrego and what Borrego told him. And what he told me was like, they're going to give me the ball. And you, you saw him essentially be the Pelicans point guard to start the year. You know, Brandon Ingram, is a very good passer for his size. I wouldn't call him elite, but he's very good. This is someone who averaged almost six assists per game. He's very good at reading the angles of the defense and finding creases, playing those angles to get the ball to his teammates. And he's willing to do it, right? You know, you think of black holes on offense where the ball touches their hands and it never leaves it. That isn't Ingram, actually, despite you know some of the flaws that he has, faults that he has as a player. He's not like that. So you can keep the ball moving. But now with DeJounte Murray here, you know, Zion Williamson kind of proving that he can be healthy. And one of the reasons what they tried to do last year was create what I've kind of called like a more egalitarian offense where it wasn't Zion centric, um, less heliocentric, I guess is maybe the way to put it, where, you know, if Zion goes down, at least you can still run your offense. I think that minimizes your best player and isn't really the way to go. But given Zion's injury history, I understand it. So it kind of started with Brandon Ingram, who despite his own injury history, it's not as extensive as Zion Williamson's. But now that Zion has kind of proven that hey, I was healthy last year, I'm doing all the right things because he looks great this offseason. With Murray, a point guard here, you know, does Ingram take a different role? You know, is he more of an off-ball guy that did not go well with Team USA in the FIBA World Cup just a, you know, a little over a year ago? That's never been a role that he's really played at the NBA level. You know, is he off-ball? Can you get him to buy into that? You know, is he kind of like your secondary creator? Do you, do you want to run point Zion? You know, he started that year kind of with the ball in his hand. Zion seemed out of sorts. And as the year went on, they started to get more and more Zion centric and the offense got better with that, right? You know, while Ingram is a very talented scorer and look, the points per game and the numbers that he's put up over his career show that very few guys can do that, especially at his size. There's limits to maybe him being the best guy on the team or your top offensive guy on the team. Is he willing to, you know, move off ball a little bit more? But here's the thing. They tried some of that last year. They wanted him to take more threes, and he he didn't. I've spoken about it. Others have spoken about the friction he had with the coaching staff about this sort of thing, right? It was reported, you know, I can't remember by who in the moment, but after the, you know, during the playoff series, he was screaming at head coach Willie Green, like, you got to find ways to get me open. Man, you're being guarded one-on-one. -on -one. That's on you a little bit, too. So how do they want to try and, and do this? They can find ways to get him open off ball, running through cuts, moving. When we talk about the death lineup, that's going to be an important thing. Is Brandon Ingram willing to do that? And if he doesn't, how do you kind of cater to him? Because again, there are strengths. And we talked about this last week when we were looking at his social media posts that, you know, he, he does have talents, gifts to use the words from that. Okay, you can lean into those, but it just might not be with the starters. Now, he's going to start, but if you want kind of an Ingram-centric lineup, is it with some bench guys? Is it when Zion's not on the court, when Murray's not on the court? How do you find that balance? Right now, how they plan on using Ingram seems to me to be a big unknown, an uncertainty 
for this team. They're going to use him, right? Like, you know, I know I did the show where I think it was like, could you, could you bench him? Could you not start him? And it's like, the answer to that is no, right? It's an interesting discussion on different ways to use him. And you use that as the jumping off point for said discussion, but they're going to start him. But you don't have to close games with him if he doesn't fit into what you're trying to do. We've now seen that at least once when it came to that Laker game at the end of the regular season. You know, when we talk about maximizing the lineups, you're going to hear me say versatility on defense. He can fit into that. But you need guys that are going to space the court, shoot threes, and be threats to bomb away from deep. And when I mean bomb, right, it's not just take a three on occasion. It's like you fire away a bunch. Ingram hasn't proven to be that guy. You know, you need guys that want to go through cuts and be threats without the ball. Has Ingram proven that? I'm not entirely sure. Those are some of the big questions here. You know, do you, are they kind of catering to Brandon Ingram? Are they maybe looking at trying to make him fit in a little bit more? And can you get the buy-in from that? One thing when it comes to the fit with Ingram is I'm not really worried about any discontent leaking into the season and derailing the season, hurting team chemistry, hurting the vibes. Yes, he didn't go to the workouts in California. I'm not overly concerned about that, even if I wouldn't call it the best look. Same with Zion in the past. You know, I said it's not the worst thing that he's not there. It's not great, but it's not the worst thing. We're going to apply that to Brandon Ingram here too. You know, he's going to come in and he is going to be a professional because if you want money too, and he's got a lot on the line here, that's how you're going to go and earn it. But the fit on the court, yeah, I, I don't know right now. He, he can go and he can score 20 points per game, 25, 30, right? Is that what's best for the team if he's doing that in mid-range possessions? You know, if they're going to be in the half court and their half court offense was okay last year, it wasn't tremendous. Let me pull up where they were. They were 11th in the half court last season, but that also includes putbacks. So offensive rebounds, getting it right back in. So you missed your first attempt. They're very good at that with JV, with Zion Williamson. You know, without that in there, that's a little bit of a different story. So they can be better, I think, right? They ran 79.2% um, of their offense was in the half court. Where does that rank? That's 10th. So they're in half court a lot. See, it shows they weren't a transition team, really, when you think about it. So how does Ingram fit into that, to me, is truly one of like the biggest questions right now. Does he kind of take that, I don't want to call it a step back, but like a step to fit in a little bit more or... Are they going to cater to him? What does that do? Kind of what's the overall cohesiveness with this? Will he listen to the coaching staff? Is the coaching staff going to be a little bit stricter with him? Those are the type of things that I'm concerned about. Not his attitude, not anything else. I think that's going to be fine. The players still love him. There's no concern there. There's no real worry about the chemistry or anything like that. But what's the fit? What's the plan for Brandon Ingram? You know, I think that needs to be clear from the get-go. They need to really stick with that. You know, them kind of changing his role or wanting to change his role as the season went on maybe impacted him in a negative way last year. It's kind of on both sides to deal with that sort of thing. But I think they need to come in with like a strong plan and stick with it for a while and try and make that work. And it probably starts with Zion. It then goes to DeJounte Murray and then maybe goes to Brandon Ingram. We'll see. So let me know what you think. How should they use Brandon Ingram in their offense? this upcoming season. Let me know in the comments down below on YouTube. So coming up next, let's get into the discussion around CJ McCollum, Trey Murphy, who starts, who comes off the bench. How do you balance that? Because that could impact the closing lineup in a pretty significant way. And that there's a player that I just mentioned there that could unlock this team a whole lot. I'll explain that's coming up here next in today's episode of Locked On Pelicans. And thank you for making Locked On Pelicans your first listen today and every day. We're here Monday through Friday, the number one Pelicans podcast covering everything you want to know about this Pelicans team. So please subscribe wherever you get your podcast. Join over 10,000 Pelicans fans on YouTube as well. And now for your second listen, go check out the Locked On NBA podcast. There's no off season in the NBA and Locked On NBA provides daily basketball analysis from national and local experts in 30 minutes or less. No one keeps you as informed and entertained as Locked On NBA, available on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, so we've gone over the rebounding. To me, that's maybe the biggest 
thing. Second is going to be Brain and Ingram and not trade stuff, Brain and Ingram. But what about the starting lineup? I get asked about that a lot. I put the graphic out the other day on social media that a lot of y'all were commenting on, and it had CJ McCollum coming off the bench and Trey Murphy in the starting lineup. Now, there's a little bit of an assumption made with that, in my opinion, and that's that Trey takes a leap forward. We know the shooting's going to be there. I'm not concerned about that whatsoever with him. He got better as a rebounder after his mom called him out at a press conference after a game, and that improved as the season went on. You know, we're waiting for him to kind of be an elite defender. He has the tools to do it. You know, he lacks a little bit of the the side-to-side mobility, in my opinion, but overall, like, the dude feels like he is going to be a really, really good, good player. And at someone who's 6'9", 6'10", the size is like truly there. And we'll talk about the death lineup. Let's just even do it tomorrow because it's something I really want to look at. When you look at what made those Golden State Warriors death lineups really good, there's some misconceptions about that too. It's not just Draymond Green that unlocked that lineup. Big, big part of it. It was that Iguodala could defend multiple positions too. Harrison Barnes, Kevin Durant could defend multiple positions, including centers too, with their size. Trey Murphy feels like he's the guy that could unlock a death lineup if that defense takes the step forward because it really hinges on that. The shooting is a key part of that, right? You need to be able to spread people out and beat them that way. Certainly, the shooting that he has is going to add to that. You know, if he takes that step forward, like how do you keep him on the bench? Look, CJ McCollum was underrated last year, in my opinion, like wildly underrated for the year that he had and the shooting that he had. This is someone who averaged 20 points per game on 43% shooting from three on over eight attempts, along with 4.6 assists. Defensively, is he good? No. But that offense is what they need, particularly around Zion Williamson and on a team that took the 24th most threes, so six fewest threes taken per game. You need the shooting. CJ provides a lot of the shooting, a lot of the shooting, in my opinion. So you could put him in there. But if Trey gives you the same level of shooting and gives you the rebounding and gives you the defense and the flexibility, switchability on the perimeter because the Warriors ran a switching scheme and Trey can switch and the Pelicans run a switching scheme. How how do you keep him out of there? Like, how do you do that? I'm not entirely sure. Trey Murphy last year, you know, after starting a little bit slowly with that injury, 38% from three on almost eight attempts per game. You know, his career numbers from three are 40%, basically 39%. And when you do it, pull it out per 36 minutes, he would have taken 9.5 three-point attempts per 36 minutes last year. Those numbers are really good, and they're needed alongside Zion Williamson, along with the height for rebounding. So if he can do that, you you, you got to kind of find a way to start him. Now, CJ and putting him on the bench, look, I, I don't love that idea because you, you need the shooting out there. But... You're running out of positions, it feels like, and guys to start. There's only five guys can be on the court. Zion, Ingram, and Murray are going to be a lock. Herb feels like a lock. Do you put in a center? Do you put in Trey? Do you put in CJ? I don't know. Like, I don't know. I understand the need for a center. I don't think you can run. You know, the Warriors' death lineup, we're using that kind of in relation to this team because if they want to really be their best, that's probably the lineup that you're looking to emulate. But when you look at that lineup, it didn't start games. It didn't start second halves. It closed games primarily. It was used at other times too throughout the game. But it closed games. It wasn't something they ran for 48 minutes in a game or even 36 minutes, whatever that lineup would play together. That's where you kind of run into some of the the big questions and concerns here of like, okay, if that's the ideal lineup, yeah, how do you deploy it? When do you deploy it? And who's involved in it? You need the shooting. CJ has the shooting with that lineup. Look, Steph wasn't an elite defender, but everyone else kind of was in that lineup, right? Clay Thompson, that point in his career, had some versatility on that side of the ball. Iguodala, Draymond Green, Harrison Barnes, or Kevin Durant. Like all of those guys were kind of doing that sort of thing that made it really work. The Pelicans are players with those archetypes that could fit that. Trey is one of them. CJ, to a lesser extent, but the shooting is really important. He was good. Now, he didn't show up in the playoffs. That's a concern here, and that's kind of the lasting impression that we have from him this year. But 
do, who do you start? And if, look, if you're bringing CJ off the bench and his role is diminished, you know, given that he's making 30 plus million dollars this season, and I think next season as well, right? Yeah, he's going to be making 33.333 this year. It declines next year to 30.1, let's call it. Um, sorry, 31 million, let's call it. That's tradable. You know, I went on our Locked On Fantasy Basketball show uh, earlier in the summer, and, you know, he's like, give me one big surprise, one kind of, like, shock you prediction this year. Josh Lett, I can't do it in an Australian accent, but he has one. And I said, CJ McCollum's going to get traded, not Brandon Ingram, because if you're bringing CJ off the bench, man, that's a lot of money to be spending on a six-man. He's great. He fits. There's a need for him, but if he's not starting and playing like that significant of a role at times... Maybe the Pelicans look to move on from him and try and add some mid-tier salary to go get a center or an upgrade in that capacity. And if you're starting training, he's giving you a lot of what you need. Oh, that makes me wonder a little bit. And I think that opens this team up more. And we'll look at that in tomorrow's show about the death lineup and how that works and how the Pelicans could try and emulate that and when they would use it and how it can make them a pretty strong team. I think we'll also look at the defense later in the week too, forcing steals and how they might play on that side of the ball, because I do think it will be a little bit different this year, but not too different. We'll cover those later this week here on Lockdown Pelicans, because we are back to five days a week, Monday through Friday here on the Lockdown Pelicans podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Jake Madison at Nola Jake on Twitter. Oh, should have mentioned this at the beginning. Sports drink on Wednesday, the what is that the 18th, I believe. They we are doing a panel with Shamit Dua, Christian Clark, David Grubb, Will Guillory. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Go there, tweet it about it. Um, come say hi in person. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Looking forward to seeing you there. Should have said that in the beginning. My bad. I'll say it tomorrow. I'll say it Wednesday. See y'all then, and I'll see y'all tomorrow here on Locked On Pelicans.